environment, border and border security, and trade. And this is one of those issues today that on the surface looks just like a border issue, but if you scratch a little more, it's got implications for trade and overall relations for both of our neighbors. Entry exit has long been desired, and I was just talking with a colleague who said she's been working on it for a very long time. Um, we need to, you know, desire to track who enters the country, but can we develop a system that at the same time notes exits? We've got a great panel today. Um, as I said, today's program is being webcast, so when we do come to the question and answer period, please wait for a microphone. In addition to the webcast, we are taking advantage of opportunities that lesser technology provides by bringing in one of our speakers, Kathleen Campbell Walker, by telephone from Texas. So it's a pleasure to be able to welcome Colleen Manaher back to the Wilson Center. She was here several years ago wearing another hat to discuss border related issue, the Western Hemisphere Travel Initiative. I happened to be in Canada the day the Western Hemisphere Travel Initiative went live and was with some colleagues from the U.S. Embassy in Ottawa. Um, and they were amazed at how well it went. There were maybe a handful of people across the border who didn't show up with documentation, which goes to show that when you prepare, it can work. <laughs> so I would like to briefly introduce the moderators for today's program. Teresa Cardinal Brown on my far left will moderate the first panel. Teresa is a longtime colleague who has worked on border issues through stints at the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, the Department of Homeland Security, the U.S. Embassy in Ottawa. She consults on related issues through her firm, Cardinal North Strategies, and has recently joined the Bipartisan Policy Center as the Director of Immigration Policy. My Wilson Center colleague, Chris Wilson, will moderate the second panel. Chris is an associate with the Center's Mexico Institute, which is a co-sponsor of today's program. Chris leads the Mexico Institute's research and programming on regional economic integration and U.S.-Mexico border affairs. And he's, he is feverishly putting the last touches on a primer on NAFTA at 20. So with that, I'll turn the podium over to Teresa. Enjoy the morning. Thank you very much. Can everyone hear me? Oh, good. Thank you. Um, thank you, everybody. Thank you for coming out on uh, kind of a icy, rainy, miserable morning um, to discuss uh, entry exit and its impact um, on the borders. Um, I've been involved in this issue, as, as uh, David mentioned, for a number of years, um, at both uh, in sort of the outside immigration advocacy world as well as for the business community and the trade world inside DHS and now outside again. And the issue has evolved over that time. And one of the things we want to do in this first panel is provide a little bit of perspective on the evolution of the entry exit requirements and statute, where it came from, how it's being looked at from the policymakers, but most importantly right now from the legislative side. Um, for those who aren't aware, the original requirement for an entry and exit system came about as part of a 1996 immigration legislation. And originally the purpose was mostly about how do we understand from an immigration standpoint who has entered and left the country for the purpose of tracking visa overstayers. Um, the, the purpose of the system has evolved again in legislation passed after the 9-11 attacks, which added a biometric component to the system and looked at it from sort of a national security nexus. Well, here we are again in 2014, and Congress is once again looking at immigration issues, and guess what's back on the table? The entry exit system. Again, looking at it mostly at this point, again, from the purpose of the immigration lens. So our panelists this morning, uh, on the first panel, we're going to discuss sort of the legislative history, the policy uh, evolution of this, how it interacts with immigration and trade and bilateral relations. Um, our first panelist is, uh, as mentioned, Kathleen Campbell Walker, who is joining us by uh, telephone from uh, Texas, where um, she is so in demand that she has another presentation to do today. So we thank her for taking the time to join us this morning. Uh, Kathleen is a past president and general counsel of the American Immigration Lawyers Association. She's with, with the Cox Smith Law Firm in El Paso, Texas. And throughout her long uh, career doing Im immigration law and policy, she's been heavily involved, being from El Paso, in border issues as well, um, and has longtime experience with immigration, cross-border trade, and travel trends. And she has testified before Congress on these issues of entry exit at least twice, probably more than that, that I'm aware of. Um, so her, she has a longtime expertise in this issue. And we've asked Kathleen this morning to talk a little bit from the immigration perspective um, about the entry exit uh, requirements, how it interacts with immigration law and policy. So Kathleen, can you hear us all right? Yes, I can, thank you. Can you all hear me? Great, okay, Kathleen, go ahead. 
Well, okay. Um, I'm sort of uh, disjointed this morning. I apologize because I can't see all faces, but thank you for the time. I wanted to try to walk through after reading some of this material um, about the reason why in 18 years, basically since 1996, we don't have exit control. And I have finished reading uh, the January 9th border security report by the Congressional Research Service, which I thought was really excellent on inspections at ports of entry. The, the points I wanted to raise is that, to me, the reason we do not have implementation is just basically a reality check. Um, I'm really astounded at the Republicans' comment on the ed entry exit system as one of their critical points on the standard for immigration reform. And here, here's the problem. At a land border, and that's been a, a, a sticking point for years, the land border is the issue. And so that's the vast majority of an entries to the United States. And the problem we have right now is we've done a, a several rounds just from an entry perspective on trying to be able to establish a scan, a review, each time someone enters the United States. We have RFID implemented in the laser visas, for example, that Mexican nationals must get from a U.S. consulate to be able to enter the United States as a visitor. The RFID that we have right now, utilized by millions of Mexican nationals, is still a problem because you come into the United States, and then the issue is whether or not I have to get an admission document called an I-94, which is still what we use, the paper version, not the electronic version that's recently been implemented in Air and Sea. And so what I'm very frustrated about is if you're on the ground um, at a land border, you understand that right now we are asking our local communities to help CBP in being able to staff properly in order to even try to be able to expedite the review of people with legitimate documents. So El Paso is one of the five cities recently that was granted this project to be able to <coughs> engage with public-private partnership. I can tell you we're just starting to see in this public-private partnership with CBP and the city of El Paso whether or not we really will be able to gain any benefit from the, the dollars of our citizens in a poor border community to help expedite entry to the United States. So we have restrictions on staffing, um, infrastructure, and although technology has improved, we are still having issues related to tracking entry. So uh, the idea of having exit implemented rapidly, and I would say anything even in a five to ten year range is a stretch because in some circumstances you've got to build ports of entry. You've got to add lanes. And I don't understand why that message cannot be delivered more clearly. Um, I've also read a number of these proposals concerning, you know, the idea that it's so simple. If we already have RFID implemented, why can't we just go ahead and just have some kind of tracking mechanism uh, to read the RFID uh, document as you depart the United States? Well, the problem is, is that the card needs to be connected to the person. So I think what would be really useful this morning is to have a discussion about the issue between biometric and biographic um, standards, if we really need to have biometric uh, to meet uh, the demands on the security issue and the land border environment because honestly I don't see how we get there on the southern border period and also in the electronic I-94 context with air and sea we have a major problem right now in that when you depart the United States um, at, by land after entering by air or sea obviously we're not able to document the departure and that's very important from an immigration perspective because if you're trying to be compliant then what you're hoping to do is show that you have timely departed the United States otherwise 
you could be subject to not being able to be readmitted to the United States under the visa waiver program. Your visa can be canceled under just automatically under a section of law called 222G of the Immigration and Nationality Act. And that's it. It's just canceled by the action of the failure to depart timely. So we have severe consequences, but I think we're a long way from being able to effectuate this in an efficient way. And I, I just don't see that we ever discuss this very realistically. Okay. Thank you, Kathleen. Is there more you wanted to add? Kathleen, is there more you wanted to add? I'm sorry. No, I'm sorry. I'm just, you know, as far as, you know, whatever else we're going to cover this morning, I don't know if we're going to have any dialogue going back and forth, we but if we're going to have a discussion about the various alternatives that have been tried over the past 18 years, um, I know the Department of Homeland Security and Customs and Border Protection has certainly advanced their capabilities in a number of different levels. I, I just would like to suggest that we should be considering how entry to the United States, we do this on the northern borders because of the sharing of data between Canada and the United States, that entry into the country, whether it's Canada or the United States, allows the mechanism of exit departure to occur. We don't have that level of sharing, obviously, with Mexico, but any, any entry to the United States constitutes a potential departure of it individual from the United States in the past, if we could come up with some sort of mechanism where the person could, by their entry to the United States, be documented, if, it, if they come back in within a 60-day time frame or whatever we agree upon, that could be a way to effectuate some tracking of departure. That doesn't deal with people who are going to be overstays and then go into the United States and try to work, and that's where... You know, we're hoping that E-Verify eventually and more stringent worksite enforcement will assist in trying to prevent um, individuals from coming to the United States and working without authorization. But that's a long way from the issue of terrorism and issues of, you know, those who actually threaten our safety, which is a totally separate discussion. That's really all I have at the moment, and happy to talk about global entry and how it works or doesn't work. I'm a member of global entry and have been of Nexus and have also been a century, but even with all of those frequent traveler programs, which I certainly think are, are good things, um, frequent traveler programs on the southern border have also been challenged because of the amount of traffic coming across. Sometimes your benefit of being in a vehicle and being in a trusted traveler you don't experience it. And that's utilizing RFID technology. And we have ready lanes as well that utilize RFID technology to help expedite crossings. But the problem is you still need the individual CBP officer to review the document and the person. And we do not have sufficient staffing and infrastructure. So that's, that's our challenge. Okay, thank you very much, Kathleen. Okay, so next we're gonna to turn to Chris Sands. And Chris is a senior fellow at the Hudson Institute and he's been specializing in Canada and US relations for a very long time as well. I won't say how long. Um, he's a professional lecturer at Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies and adjunct professor at American University. He has uh, provided insight on US Canada issues to the Department of State and the Department of Homeland Security. Is the author, co-author of a few books on us canada relations and so if i've asked chris to talk a little bit about the implications of this entry exit system a little bit on our foreign relations particularly with canada a little bit with mexico as well because he's got some experience there so chris go ahead uh, thank you very much teresa and um and i i want to put even more context um, to the discussion that kathleen opened up for us because although this history has been rolling along for a long time, it is easy to forget the details of it. And when you look at the long discussion that leads us to where we are today, you see that we've, in a, in a sense, moved through three A's, if you will. Aspiration, which was expressed in legislation and, and popular concern in the United States about how our borders were managed. 
advances as technology moved forward and gave us options we didn't have before, and attitude. And then in some ways, the attitude piece is the most important because attitude gradually went from distrust and a lack of confidence towards greater trust, which I think is what's enabling us to move, to even have a discussion that we're having about entry and exit. Where's the distrust? Between the administration and Congress, between Washington and the U.S. states, some in particular, and also distrust between the U.S. and our Canadian and Mexican neighbors, who at different times had a, had a sort of defensive posture towards what the United States was trying to do, and the U.S. wasn't exactly able to win them over or won them over um, somewhat wimpily. Can you say wimpily? <laughs> anyway. um, and so let me talk a little bit about that and give you a bit more history uh, than most of you want and, and certainly more history than some of you have, have lived through, um, given, given, as always, the Wilson Center's excellent young audience, um, and take you back to 1986. What a great time. You know, the fashions were good. You know, the, the video games were clunky, but they were, they, were still, uh, they were still something. And in 1986, the Congress passed the Immigration Reform and Control Act. Um, the Immigration Reform and Control Act was uh, one of the landmark pieces of immigration legislation to come out of Congress uh, back when they passed legislation regularly. Um, and what was significant about it was a couple of things. It um, shifted a burden for verifying citizenship onto employers. It made it illegal for employers to hire people who didn't have legal status in the country, kind of put a heavy burden on them on the assumption that it was jobs that were drawing some immigrants, particularly Mexican migrants, into the United States. And um, it included an amnesty for those who came before 1982 so they could regularize their status. That bargain, trying to bring everybody into the system, creating a new tough rule, but at the same time forgiveness for, for a certain uh, wave, represented a, a hopeful addressing of the issue, but a, a compromise that very quickly uh, fell to criticism uh, on, on all sides. Also in 1986, we saw something else passed. It was a piece of legislation introduced by another Wilson, we have a lot of Wilsons around today, Pete Wilson, who was senator from California at the time, called the Federal Intergovernmental Regulatory Recovery Act. Does anybody remember that? That act was an act that Pete Wilson believed strongly in, former mayor of San Diego, former California State Assemblyman, now a U.S. Senator, argues that when Washington, D.C. brings in a mandate that the states have to bear costs associated with implementing the mandate or as collateral damage from the mandate, the federal government must compensate the states. Now that was something that came very squarely from where Pete Wilson stood. This was something very important to him, and, and it had implications, which I'll come to in a minute. The other thing we did in 1986, which is not insignificant with regard to our Canadian friends, is we began negotiation of a Canada-US Free Trade Agreement, a very different paradigm. We talked in those days about eliminating a border or at least reducing its impact and encouraging free trade. So while our Mexican uh, friends were feeling, well, there's a lot of debate about us, uh, migration is a hot political issue, but we feel like we're making progress, the Canadians felt like, well, we're moving beyond all this, we're moving to a new era of free trade. Fast forward just a little bit. In 1991, Pete Wilson has taken office as the governor of California, and the costs of illegal migrants or undocumented migrants on his state budget is high, and because he's a believer in federal compensation, he asks the federal government to help pay for the costs of undocumented migrants on, for their schools, their hospitals, and other state services. At that time, George H.W. Bush is president, not Wilson's old buddy Ronald Reagan, and George H.W. Bush has a different vision. He wants to negotiate a North American Free Trade Agreement to extend the same vision and paradigm he's had with Canada to Mexico. This is not part of his agenda, an aggressive sort of pushback on, um, on immigration. As At the same time, remember that our friend George H.W. Bush is famous for saying, read my lips, no new taxes. He faces a recession, a difficult budget. There's no money that he sees to be able to throw to California and help pay for these costs. The precedent it sets is one he doesn't want to sign on for. So he tells Wilson no. Begins the North American Free Trade um, uh, negotiations. And 
we find ourselves sort of moving forward into 1993. Well, 1993, we've gotten rid of George H.W. Bush. The Clinton era has begun. And Bill Clinton has inherited a NAFTA agreement that he knows is going to be a difficult sell uh, in Congress. He's starting to think about it. He goes to congressional leaders and says, what will it take for me to get this through? And congressional leaders at the time, Democratic majorities in the House, say to him, we need an Immigration Modernization Act and we need a Customs Modernization Act to bring in some of the technology that's now available to make the borders work better. Because after the Canada's Free Trade Agreement, we saw a surge of border crossers, and that surge of border crossers had a big impact on our communities, a big strain on the infrastructure we had. If we have a similar proportional wave of people crossing the border after the North American trade, Free Trade Agreement takes effect from Mexico, we're going to have a problem. Because we're not adequately staffed, we don't have the right people, and we aren't using technology smartly. So Clinton says, great. Let, let's do that. Let's do that deal. And although Congress is able to get a Customs Modernization Act, they are unable to come to agreement on the Immigration Modernization Act because of issues arising in California elsewhere where people feel that you can't modernize immigration without at the same time dealing with some of these, uh, the status of undocumented uh, people in the United States. Lead us, leads us to 1994. 1994, uh, we have a couple of big things. First, there's the NAFTA ratification at the beginning, or at the very end of 93, that brings this into effect and raises a lot of concerns about our new relationship with Mexico and what this will mean on migration, some of them quite unfounded. But it leads us to the midterms in 1994, congressional midterms in which California is very much in play. Pete Wilson is running for re-election as governor, and he runs for re-election in part on the immigration issue. He's introduced a proposition, you know, California loves their ballot issues and their ballot propositions, that we remember is Proposition 187, that says if the federal government isn't compensating us, undocumented um, Californians cannot have public services. It's a very harsh measure. He feels it's a way of sending a signal to Washington, D.C., if you're not paying for it, we're not either, and this is going to be up to you. He's a fiscal conservative. He thinks this is the right position. And independents and Republicans vote strongly for that. They reelect Wilson, and they elect a whole slew of Republicans to Congress, who come in as part of the Gingrich Revolution to Washington with one very important lesson from that election, which is that immigration politics are good for the Republicans. And they come in in 1994 with a very different attitude of an immigration. And it is from that that we get the 1996 Illegal Immigration Reform and Immigrant Responsibility Act, which many of you will be familiar with. The politics of this act are very different than the 1986 act de a decade earlier. In this particular legislation, there are some significant changes. First, and we heard about this from Kathleen, if you're unlawfully in the United States for 180 days but less than 365, you're to leave the country, to be deported or to leave the country, and you can't come back for three years. So there's a penalty. And if you stay longer than 365, 365 days, a full year undocumented, you're supposed to leave the country and stay out for 10 years. So there's a new access penalty that's been introduced. At the same time, there is a, an empowerment of federal state cooperation in law enforcement to try to get state police and local police working to enforce immigration law. And by the end of 1996, we have California, Arizona, Alabama, Florida, and North Carolina a little bit farther away from the border, all signing deals with the Justice Department on immigration enforcement. The other thing that was in the 1996 Act, which is, um, which is remembered, is something called Section 110, which was a provision on entry-exit that, that asked the INS to document the entry and exit of each individual coming, through the country, coming in and out of the country. This was an aspiration. Congress knew that it was going to be difficult to do, uh, but they wanted this done by 1998, leaving the agency, the INS, to figure out how they nonetheless made that request. And they did so in part because of some one of those, those theatrical congressional hearings where Lamar Smith of Texas had the INS commissioner in front of his, his panel and said, you know, I have here a list of murderers, child pornographers, rapists, the villainy of the earth who are all undocumented in the United States. They've all been ordered deported. They've been convicted. Can you tell me, have they left this country? And the INS commissioner says, no, I, I do entry. We don't have that capacity. I can't tell you that. Aha, 
that meant that you had to have this entry exit control. This is sort of the motion of this issue in 1996. Canada and Mexico react very differently to the 1996 legislation. And it's for reasons of this history. Mexico feels that the United States is on the warpath and that they are the target of this legislation. That the old 1986 deal, not perfect, but at least somewhat friendly, is now being replaced by tough love, if not outright hate. The politics of California have suggested that Mexico bashing could be in. There are undocumented people in, in the United States who are in some peril that Mexico feels concerned for and wants to see dealt, you know, taken care of. So you, you have all of this. And on the other side, you have Canada. Canada has Kennedy's free trade. They saw NAFTA. They saw the NAFTA debate. They saw that while Kennedy's free trade was a hot issue in Canada, it wasn't much of an issue in the United States. But in Mexico, or in the NAFTA debate, Mexico was a hot issue in the United States. And Canadians draw from this, well, maybe we don't want to be too close to those Mexicans. They're radioactive. Getting too close to them drags us into some very tough politics that we don't want to be involved in. So Canada focuses on Section 110, entry exit controls. And they begin a campaign to try to push entry exit controls implementation forward into the future. And they do so because they think, well, this will cause huge backups to the border, long lines. We don't want that. We've never had to deal with that before. And they go to the Mexicans and they say, join us in fighting this in Congress. And Mexico's like, are you kidding? There's so much that we have to talk about and you're worried about the entry exit controls? I mean, that's a part of it, but there's a whole debate. Join us in having a big debate with Congress. And Canada's like, eh, no, we just have our little thing and we want to fight that. And you can do the rest on your own. So Canada and Mexico, who don't really have a very well-developed relationship, don't find common cause very effectively in the Section 110 fight, or, which is how Canada views it. And Canada is eager to show, well, look, we're fighting Section 110, but we're also on your side. So they launched the Shared Border Accords, the Border Vision Initiative, a number of dialogues meant to get Americans thinking about what the future of the border should be now that we have free trade. And what makes the Canadian campaign against Section 110 effective is they have an ally in the INS. The INS sees this as an unfunded mandate. They haven't been given budget to figure out how they're going to implement this provision. They don't have the staff. They don't have the resources. And they resist it. And so when the Canadians come in and also resist it, between the two of them, they're able to build up real pressure against this provision. There are hearings in Buffalo and Detroit as congressmen meet and talk about long delays, talk about the environmental impact of cars idling at the Cana Canadian border. And this convinces Congress in 1998 to delay the deadline for implementation of entry, entry exit controls from 98 all the way to 2000. Congress, uh, Congress has given that delay because, of course, the INS doesn't have a strategy and they don't have the money to give INS uh, to, give, to get spiffy new computers or, or any of the other solutions that we would think about later. Canada and the U.S. continue to talk about the border. They develop something called the Canada-U.S. Partnership to get stakeholders along the border to come up with ideas. The business community is engaged for how the border could be more fluid, how we could facilitate trade. Um, everything's humming along pretty nicely in 2000, and then we get 2001 and September 11, and the debate changes again. George W. Bush, who comes into office, relatively favorable with a more Texan attitude about Im illegal immigration. Um, a little bit more open to the Mexicans looking to build a good relationship is seen as a, as a sort of a good sign at first, his, his coming in. He reaches out to Mexico very early in his administration. But September 11 changes everything. And the Bush administration reasserts the importance of the border, but now with a very new mission. It's not about collecting tariffs. It's not even about preventing Mexican illegal immigration. The border is now about protecting American citizens from terrorism. And that is significant. I'm going to race through this history because this next bit you know. So we get September 11. We get in 2002 the creation of DHS. Now INS is no longer part of the Department of Justice. It's part of the Department of Homeland Security, which has a generous budget because, of course, people are concerned. What are we going to do um, to address our, our terrorism challenges? And the 9-11 Commission meets. The 9-11 Commission, which Bush doesn't particularly endorse or appreciate at first, is appointed by Congress to take a look at how this 9-11 attack happened. What do we do wrong? And one of the things the 9-11 Commission identifies is we didn't have very good border controls. And they identify a particular sort of quirk, something called the, the Western Hemisphere Exemption, whereby for certain countries, if you were an American, and some of you will remember this, you could come back into the United States without a passport. 
from Canada, from some Caribbean islands. It was kind of a, a compromise. It was based on the difficulty of, of actually getting everybody to have passports and people who crossed the border easily, but it was just an exemption. And the 9-11 Commission said, this is crazy. We can't have people exempted from showing ID at the border. This is not good. Well, that technically they had to have a birth certificate and government issued ID like a driver's license prior, but often that was waived and the feeling was, no, you can't have this anymore. You have to have good border documentation. You have to have a passport a secure piece of documentation. This was consistent with a raising of international passport standards so that they had biometric support, which also came at about the same time. Canada um, reacted to this negatively in part because individual Canadians had been given sort of a, I don't know, they got included in the Western Hemisphere exe exemption. It was never in law, it was never in statute, but most of the time if they crossed the border without a passport, that was okay too. You, they're living in, in the Disneyland border over here. Everything is working pretty well for them, and they see it slipping away as 9-11 toughens up the border. Meanwhile, Mexico has a very different set of problems, and the Canadians and Mexicans, again, are not on the same page. Even though after September 11, Canada proposes the shared border accord, Mexico uh, very quickly has a, a smart border accord of its own. The two come together in a series of border forms, but entry exit is not on the list. The 9-11 Commission puts it back on the list, and in 2004, when the 9-11 Commission report comes out, it's followed by the Intelligence Reform and Terrorism Prevention Act. That act includes um, the passport requirement for all American citizens coming home um, and something called the Western Hemisphere Travel Initiative. And if you're Canadian or, or were in Canada at the time, you think of WHTI as something villainous. David Biet told it, reminded us about the fight over WHTI. But WHTI was Congress's attempt to fund some awareness campaigns to help ease the transition to the passport requirement. It wasn't the villain. The villain was the passport requirement, but you know, acronyms are acronyms and campaigns are campaigns, and that became the bad guy. When we started having biometric support for passports, it was very important that we have good documentation of the border. We were using intelligence to fight the war on terror. If we didn't know who had come and gone from the United States, we were losing a very important piece of data that could help us to find bad guys. Um, in 2006, we had another little interesting change. The election of the first Harper government in Canada, a conservative government with a minority uh, in Parliament, but one which was determined to improve the relationship with the United States, and the election of the Calderon government in, in Mexico that was concerned about the drug war and what it could do to encourage U.S.-Mexico cooperation, but also wanted to see some progress on the immigration fight. And you remember this history, it's relatively recent. The Harper and Calderon governments work as best they can to try to cooperate with the United States on its border concerns, on the understanding that terrorism is different than the migration. And in 2010, U.S. and Mexico signed the 21st Century Border Management Accord, which does not include entry exit, but includes a lot of upgrades to infrastructure and, and other elements of cooperation. In 2011, Canada, not to be outdone, signs the Beyond the Border Agreement, which includes a very surprising, uh, maybe not for Teresa, she was in Ottawa at the time, but a, a surprising gesture from the Harper government, that the Harper government is willing to institute a passport requirement for its own citizens, to gather passport data electronically as people cross at the land border as well as air borders, and to exchange entry data into Canada with the United States to serve as our ex ex exit data. For, for the first time we have the trust from the Canadians, technology that would allow this to be done quickly and easily through data exchange, fulfilling the aspiration of the legislation that was by then almost uh, 20 years old. And that's where we are today. The difficulty of entry exit has been not just about solving the technology problem, and, and we heard a bit of that from Kathleen, not just about issuing legislative mandates out of Congress and the difficult debate there, and resolving the fight between Washington and the states over immigration enforcement. It was also about building trust. And where we are today, far greater trust between the U.S. and Canada, growing trust with the U.S. and Mexico, not 100 percent, but still very poor trust between Washington and the states and the public about the seriousness on immigration reform. This issue gets tied into immigration reform because of this history. It's difficult because of this history. And it isn't mean-spirited Republicans, uh, open-door Democrats. Uh, it isn't, you know, perfidious Congress and a wise administration or an idiotic administration and a wise Congress. It comes down to being a very difficult issue to, to resolve. And until we saw this 
movement towards all three A's coming together, the, the technology advance, the legislative aspiration, and the attitude of trust among the players, we couldn't even talk about where we are today. And I think that's the hopeful sign that we may yet see a fourth A, and that's the achievement of entry exit controls in our lifetime. Thank you for that rapid fire history tour. <laughs> very comprehensive, it's what you expect from a professor, right? Um, well, thank you very much. Um, I'm just gonna set sort of a, a, a little bit of a chapeau on all of this, and, and I think we've identified several issues. When we talk about entry exit, you can talk about it from any of a number of lenses, as, as Chris said. Um, originally, it came about as a de an issue of immigration enforcement. It has evolved into, through 9-11, into an issue of security. Um, we are back to it as an issue of immigration enforcement. But throughout all of that, the challenge of actual implementation, the technology, the logistics, the, um, the, the regulatory and, and financial uh, issues surround actually achieving this goal that Congress set back in 1996 have really complicated the issue. And where we are now in the debate is that we are looking at, once again, at it through the immigration lens and legislation in Congress. And for those who aren't familiar, there are at least three different um, pieces of legislation that currently are re attempting to readdress the entry exit mandate from the legislative side. Um, the Senate Immigration Comprehensive Bill had a requirement um, that would establish a biometric exit system within two years of enactment at the 10 highest volume airports within six years at 30 international airports, um, would plan a biometric system for major C and entry exit points and require that within six years there is a plan to Congress to implement it at major land entry exit points. So reaffirming and setting some new deadlines and time frames. Um, in the House, uh, the House Homeland Security Committee has a bill that they've introduced, the Biometric Exit Improvement Act, which is H.R. 3141, that would require a biometric exit system within two years at the 10 highest volume airports, within five years at all airports, at seaports within two years at the 10 highest volume seaports, within five years at all seaports, and for the land within three years of enactment, establish a biometric exit system at least for pedestrians, and with 18 months, a six month pilot for each of the systems above. Okay, so a little bit more definitive what next steps for, for the Department of Homeland Security to implement. And then uh, the another bill that passed through the House Judiciary Committee, um, H.R. 2278, which is called the SAFE Act, which primarily deals with interior immigration enforcement, also included language from a bill introduced by our friend Lamar Smith called the Smart Borders Act that would simply say you must establish biometric entry and exit at all ports of entry everywhere within two years, period. So as you can see, there's some differences in how Congress is looking at this issue, but the characteristic I see fairly firmly in this is those who are looking at it through an immigration lens tend to be much more adamant about get it done now. <laughs> those who are looking at it from a more holistic sort of homeland security border lens say, well, okay, we see the challenges, how can we implement it? Um, and that, that divergence of opinion is playing out as the debate goes forward. If you're looking at this issue from a perspective of immigration enforcement, you look at it and say, well, we, we said we were going to secure the borders. We haven't secured the borders from illegal immigration, so we need to get this done so we can do it. Um, again, those who live on the border, such as Kathleen and those who are from the northern border, understand the reality is a lot more challenging than that. We've focused a lot on the land border, but I don't want to overlook the challenge that does still exist at the airports. And I probably, Kathleen or Colleen is going to talk about this a little bit. But although we have a lot better data that we collect in the airport environment because of the information that's collected by airlines and shared with CBP, the biometric challenge on exit is similar in that at no ports of entry in the United States do we have an exit control infrastructure that requires everybody to check out. We have never done that at airports, at seaports, at land borders. We have never done that. Many countries in the world do that. The United States never has. So simply from an infrastructure challenge, that remains. And how in the world you implement a biometric factor on that system is going to be important as the debate goes forward. And I'm sure the second panel is going to address that a little bit more. Um, Andrew, we have time for some Q&A. Okay, I'm sorry, we want to make sure that we have. Okay, so if there are a few questions, uh, Kathleen is not able to join us for the Q&A, but uh, we'll try to answer in her stead if we can. 
Are there folks in the audience who have some questions? Right up front here. Hi, uh, Mark Rosenblum. Uh, I'm at the Migration Policy Institute, but I was at CRS until last month, and I wrote the report that um, yeah. Kathleen kindly mentioned. Good report. Thank you. <laughs> um, uh, I wanted to return to her, since especially since she's off the line, re-flag her question about the value of biometrics versus biographics. And you know, I, I, in particular, uh, it seems that to the extent we're primarily concerned about tracking overstays and, and counting how many people leave and how many people enter, that, that biographics gets us you know, almost all the way there. And my understanding is that biographics, you know, most of our um, national security and public safety databases are also much more biographic than biometric. So it also gets us virtually all the way there from a, you know, from a security and, and securing the border perspective. So you know, I find it a little puzzling that so much of the emphasis, particularly in the Senate bill, is on tooling up the biometrics. And, and I wonder if maybe the CBP folks or, or others in the audience can talk about how much, you know, for example, putting an RFID system in place gets us there on, on biometric, uh, I'm sorry, on biographic exit, uh, and how much is that a, a, a building block towards doing a biometric system, and, and how much does it distract CBP from getting a biographic system up and running to be focused on, on biometrics? I mean, that's, you know, that's the statutory mandate, so I know that that's on the radar, but, but I wonder if, you know, how much it's, it's th those, those reinforce each other versus competing with each other. So uh, not to speak for DHS, but certainly in various testimonies, Department of Homeland Security has articulated exactly what you said, which is we feel like we are doing a pretty good job collecting bio biographic data, and we are utilizing that in a much better way than we were, for example, in 1996 when, this, when it was first instituted. Um, and that can get us a long way toward what people are looking at. There are still challenges with capturing even biographic data on exit at land borders, um, but we are capturing at least some biographic information on entry uh, now that we have the Western Hemisphere Travel Initiative in place and people are having to present documents. Um, I think the issue really becomes one of data integrity. Um, you know, obviously, I think it's most people have sort of accepted that biometrics will get you a much better um, certainty that you are talking about the people who they are supposed to be, right? It's identity verification. And I think for many members in Congress, that extra piece is important. Um, you know, in, in determining whether or not, you know, the people that are supposed to have left the country actually left the country. Um, you asked a good policy question, which is, and, and this is probably for Congress to think about, how much money do we spend and how much extra benefit do we get to, to do that? And I don't think anybody really has done that analysis yet in government, certainly not in Congress. Um, you know, but that's something that probably needs to be explored. I don't know, Chris, and just you know? two things there. I think that there, we're also dealing with the legacy of, in 1996, the Congress decided to leave what was then the INS to figure out how to implement it. And I think there are some people in Congress who feel, A, that it still isn't done, therefore we have to be more specific about what we want, um, and because uh, biometric doesn't sound as tough as, bio, or biographical doesn't sound as tough as biometric, we have to insist. The second piece of that, of course, is that Congress has always disconnected what they want from paying for it, um, <laughs> generally and in this specific case. And so they're not thinking in terms of, of the cost trade-offs, which is, which is another issue. But one of the things we've seen just in sequestration and in the last couple rounds is that DHS has gone from generally being able to be funded. I mean, nobody gets everything they want, but being in good times to basically turning the corner and having to look at cuts. And I think that's going to make uh, whiz-bang toys a, a bigger hit on a department that is also looking to make cost savings elsewhere to meet Congress's broad mandate. So okay. maybe they'll come around. Thank you, Mark, for a very excellent question. We are going to turn it over now to, to Colleen. And uh, thank you very much. Come on up. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for this great opportunity to speak to you all here at the, at the Wilson Center. And a special thank you to Andrew Finn, who handled the logistics, and to the previous panels. Um, I found the dialogue uh, uh, very interesting. And I hopefully 
um, today you will see how excited I am to tell our story on entry and exit. I was even practicing in the car on the way here today to make sure that I tell our story correctly. And I hope that when I am finished today, you will have a better understanding of this mission space. But equally as important, that you will even share my passion for it. Now, did you all know at the Winter Olympics that's happening this week, we of course have a team over there, a total of 98 events will be contested among the world, the most of any Winter Olympics. And 12 of those are brand new events, such as team figure ice skating. But I am here to tell you that there's another new Olympic event, the 13th, to take place right here at the Ronald Reagan Building, the pursuit of entry exit, which is going to be just as exciting as sudden death overtime between the US and Canada hockey teams. <laughs> but the topic we are discussing today is entry exit. And it is one that is critically important to CBP, the department, and the United States. And that means right now, but especially for our future. Because this has the potential to transform every process. But why is it so important? Exit data is critical because it goes to the core of the integrity of the immigration system. That's why it's important. If we don't know who is leaving and when, then how do we know who is violating law? Having exit data provides information to identify those who overstay their authorized period of admission to the United States. By knowing when a foreign national departed, we can then accurately determine who is abiding by the terms of their admission. It also allows enforcement agencies to better prioritize deployment of the scarce enforcement resources. Finally, it supports a fact-based evidence on immigration that can be used to inform policy decisions so that we can make smart decisions, whether at the congressional or at the administration level. Questions like, who should be in the visa waiver program? Where should we focus our very few investigators? Those questions are much more easy for the decision maker to make when we actually have fact-based evidence. So why is it so complicated? So having exit data is clearly important, which we just established, but why is it so complicated? The answer, of course, goes to how the transportation infrastructure has evolved over time. Whether air, land, or sea, it was built within the framework of the freedom to leave. In some countries, such as Australia, all passengers traveling are sent through a centralized checkpoint in which travelers see an officer on both entry and departure. Any of you who have just fl flown internationally know that's not the same in the United States. And at the land border, the lack of a departure infrastructure is even more pronounced. Today, vehicles depart the United States into Canada and Mexico at speed, and possibly at 50 miles an hour. There's often a ratio used, 5 to 1 in terms of entry lanes into the United States when you compare that to exit lanes. Now, just to give you just a little predictive statistic here, if CBP were to even staff outbound activities and even had the staff to do it, we would hit gridlock at 40% capacity. Just interesting in the land border environment. And we would hit gridlock against our largest trading partners and our best friends. So transition to CBP. So we have a complicated project that is critical to the integrity of the immigration system. So the equation turns out to be, I got a really important complex project plus a project where progress has been slow and a project that no one wants. So who are you going to call? CBP. <laughs> so this past April, we were given the entry exit mission. 
Now, some folks here might say, well, we might have got the short end of the stick. But if you think about that and about the future of the secure travel processing and realizing that although current legislation focuses on biometric exit, this has the potential to transform an end-to-end -end business process, not just exit, but entry. So with that, and looking five or 10 years out, CPP said, bring it on. We're gonna embrace this mission and we're gonna start to place vision into action because that's what we're about, transforming our business to meet the needs for the American people. But before I give you a sneak peek preview into the three pillars of our entry exit transformation strategy, there they are. I wanna debunk some urban myths commonly associated with biometric exit. Urban myth number one, replicate entry. So one urban myth is that you must have a fully functioning exit system. We must physically interact with the traveler and it must look the exact same way on exit as it does on entry. In other words, uh, we would replicate our whole inbound infrastructure. And what I say to that, mm, not true. Advances in biometric technology, biographic systems, smart business processes could in fact provide a transparent and non-intrusive solution. Urban myth number two, paper document please. The second urban myth is that the traveler must have some kind of control over their entry and action. They must take some kind of covert action or uh, assertive action where they are given some kind of paper document on entry and then in order to have that departure data for that traveler. This type of process was also in one of the plot developments in the Oscar winning movie Argo about the escape of American hostages from Iran. In real life, it doesn't work any better than it did in the movie. This process is inefficient and prone to administrative error. Back to urban myth number one's solution. Urban myth number three, biometrics is all that and a bag of chips. So the third urban myth is that in order to have an exit program, it must be full blown biometric data program at every air, land, and seaport of entry. And this means, so let's boil it down to the 99%. This means collecting grandma's biometrics each and every time she leaves after visiting the grandkids. And that could be the collection of fingerprints, an iris, facial. So think about that. Our entire criminal justice system is based upon biographic data from lookouts to wants to warrants to a no-fly list that the carriers assist us with. It is of course supported secondarily by biometric identifiers. So this of course brings the question of value into play. What is the value to us in the collection of grandma's biometrics. So within that framework, let's outline our new exit transformation strategy. And we will be clear. We've set our objectives, improve the existing biographic collection process, perform targeted biometric exit collection, and seek to transform the entry exit process using emerging biometric technology. Existing biographic, I think that there is a, uh, I think a lot of folks just think that there's absolutely nothing in place and it's just like willy-nilly at the borders. So I, I think the first step for us to do to improve biographics is really my job to let you know what's actually in place right now. And did you know that CBP collects nearly 100% of all departure data from foreign nationals who depart the United States via air and sea through the submission of manifest data. 
which is biographic data. The carriers, of course, are required to provide that biographic at the time of departure for all passengers. They are also required to report that data within strict time frames or they could face major delays, excuse me, major fines for delays or even inaccuracies. And just this past summer, I think what a, a tremendous achievement. The CBP, working closely with our Canadian colleagues, partnered to create a biographic entry exit system on the shared northern land border by exchanging entry information. We're matching that at 97, 98 percent. That's the northern border land, which they said, by the way, couldn't be done. As of today, we have exchanged over two million records and matching it at 97, 98 percent. That's a home run. Now, the benefits here for either country, as you can see, is we didn't have to build an expensive infrastructure and we didn't have to impact the traveling public or our trade community. Clearly, collaboration is a path we must go down. And it is with this foundation that will allow us to build a future. And we are going for the gold. So let's take a look at our biographic improvements that we're going to put into place. APIS. As I just stated, we're really matching the APIS manifests about 90, 90, about 97, 98 percent. But I want it to be bulletproof. I want it to withstand every research scholar in this room. So in order for me to do that, I've got to really attack the integrity of that data. And I'm going to do that so that I can say, come on in and take a look at that data. It's going to take me a little time to make sure I clean it up, but we're going to do that. Document validation. For those of you who are familiar with the Western Hemisphere Travel Initiative, most of you will know that is very near and dear to my heart. Um, CBP was actually the implementer of that project. And uh, I was pleased to be part of the team. And a lot of the team is here today. And again, you guys are always near and dear to my heart. We are also partnering in the Western Hemisphere, excuse me, to build upon that. We validate documents. And what that means in the land border environment, we get the document, we validate it back to source, so we get that original data. Terrific concept, extremely secure. That's the wave of the future, by the way, as well, in terms of document security, is that validation aspect. So why can't we, with our data, start to validate the documents that the carriers are seeing overseas so that our assurances get even higher? We've already piloted this program, and we're going to roll this out overseas. Canada. As I said, I think just a remarkable event, and uh, we're looking to move that out to phase three to have all of our biographic data on that northern border being shared transparently, and we're hoping to do that this summer. Mexico. Now, I would love it if Mexico's infrastructure was very similar to that of Canada. But you know what? They're there at the table. They want this to work, and I'm going to work with them. We're going to find a solution for Mexico on the biographic side whether it's RFID, license plate readers, or whether I'm going to get on a plane and go down and see how they're doing it at the checkpoints. But we're going to work it with Mexico because they are our partner here, and they're here and they realize how important this data is. We're planning a big trip later this month to meet in El Paso. For those of you who are aware, we have a, a huge initiative there, and I invite all of you to go to take a look at it, our pedestrian reengineering project. And looking at that, I'm seeing a lot of synergy between that and also a focus for, on Me the Mexican side, working with Mexico on technical assistance. So we're just starting on the Mexico relationship, but I'm gonna, that is, that's where we're going with that, and I have a lot of faith in that relationship that I can report back to you probably in a year from now, the data that we are collecting or exchanging on nationals for that. It was mentioned earlier on the RFID for pedestrian. I think that there is a lot of potential here for us to leverage the RFID secure documents. Um, we plan to exploit that as well, uh, and we will work, of course, closely with Mexico as well. But either way, those initiatives that I just talked about were all improvements to our biographic systems. 
I hope to have those in place by 2015. Because that's going to get us ready for what? For the target, which is the biometric. The next pillar of our strategy is targeted biometric operations. Some of you who have followed this issue closely know that there are many cost estimates as to how much a biographic, or excuse me, biometric system would cost. And virtually all of them are extraordinarily high, approaching billions of dollars. Now the primary cost driver on that is labor. So our plan is twofold. First, let's develop targeted approaches based on risk over and over the long term. Let's test some of the solutions within some very strict requirements. As a law enforcement agency, I want bio biometric data. I would love it on everyone. Can you imagine the information and the intelligence value of having that? But I also have a responsibility to the traveling public, to the American public, to ensure that their borders are safe, that they're secure, and that our role in economic security is met. And I won't turn our back on any of those. So what do I mean when I say target? Let's do a targeted approach. Well, you do know that CBP currently does perform outbound inspections based on law enforcement interest only in the air environment. So my premise, and I would love to know, you know what you all think of this, is let's fuse that national security mission with the biometric administrative requirement. I think that's a match made in heaven. I'm already checking those flights for a law enforcement value. Why not add in the biometric administrative part of that? So the challenge, of course, will, for technology will be, well, how would I do that? And I'm going to challenge my technical teams because we're going to get it done. We're going to have an iPad-like and take a quick biometric. The next six to eight months, I think that biometric mobile situation will be beautiful. And the same for pedestrian. In our land border environment, we have invested, and thank you to Congress and to the Hill who have really put our faith in a lot of our pedestrian environments on the southern border, long neglected environment, is to take sort of that RFID, that validation aspect. And what's one thing we've got is lots of faces. Thank you, Western Hemisphere Travel Initiative. So what's the next thing is maybe facial recognition, I can drive to our requirements to start to look at facial recognition. I'd like to prototype that this year in the southern land border pedestrian environment. So what is the biometric future? We have partnered with the research and development arm of the department, the Science and Technology Directorate, to help us determine what the feasibility is for that 100 percent solution, or roughly what is it really going to take to collect biometrics from everyone, including grandma? s and has been a tremendous partner, and I, I have to give them a shout out. I mean, just tremendous, tremendous. We've, they've already conducted the operational surveys at our top ten high volume airports. We have also brought together our officers, because for those of you who are familiar with how we operated WITI, it's the officer's solution. They, they need their fingerprints all over it, very similar to how Woody was rolled out. And our preliminary planning is almost complete. Our next stop, we're going to build a test facility in Landover, Maryland. Similar to how we did with Woody when we developed the mock land border port down in Stafford, we're, put, we're building a mock airport over in Landover, Maryland, where we would test a variety of operational concepts, a variety of biometric kind of solutions right in the process and start, start to observe that activity. This concept, of course, will differ in terms of the collection, the type of biometric, and of course any of the devices used. But our objective will be to identify the top two, and then I'm heading to a real airport. And we're going to test it out there. So we will plan to open that facility in April, our mock airport, and we will begin lab testing shortly thereafter. 
We will then follow up with additional tests during the summer, and we will actually bring in actors and travelers and all of that to try to really look at the system and really almost sort of break it down for us to see what works, what doesn't work, what should we throw out, what should we keep. And I want to add that, as again, similar with Witty, everything we do will be transparent. I would invite anyone here to our testing facility as well because I want this to be in the open. I want to hear what you have to say about it because I work at the end of the day for the American people. And that's all of you. In closing, there is a variety of statements and reports that have circulated over the last 10 months about deploying biometric exit. And some of the reports have said, hey, CBP, this is easy breezy like a Sunday morning. Well, for those of you that make that assumption, let me state our clear business requirements before you jump to that conclusion. It must be non-intrusive. It must be transparent to the traveling public. It must be secure. And get this, the response time needs to be within one and three seconds. And I have yet to see a viable biometric that can capture a van load of people traveling at 40 miles an hour in San Diego. Anyone got that? If, I'm just curious, because if you do, please let me know. <coughs> this is so important. We can't get this wrong. Having departure data on foreign national goes to the heart of the integrity of the immigration laws and the ability to enforce our laws. And it, at the same time, it speaks volumes to our national security mission. We take this mission seriously, but we are moving forward and our pace is quick. Ultimately, we will deploy a departure system, but one that rings true of good government, smart planning, and one that just makes sense. And it makes sense in terms of operations, the traveling public, cost, and schedule. And it will achieve every objective that Congress and the 9-11 Commission expect from us. And that's what the American people expect from CBP, and that is what we will deliver. With that, thank you. I'm willing to take your questions. Yes? No? <laughs> No questions? Oh. Diane Peterson for the Airports Council of International North America. As you know, many of our staff are work and airports are working with CBP and with the Directorate of Science and Technology. And um, part of my question is, as you're looking at different biometric options, are you also taking into account a basic cost-benefit analysis? As you know, we're very concerned about the impacts of, on facilities, on operations, on our finances, and on the facilitation of the passenger to biometric exit because we're not sure we see that much extra for what's going to have to be done to, to accomplish that over the biometric, uh, over the biographic approach. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, I'm in touch with every one of those um, emotions. Trust me on that. And yes, we are we're going to move out. If you notice my one comment on the value aspect, um, that's pretty critical to me. I need to answer that question just because I need to know. Um, and I'm going to try to go down a scientific path on that, independent analysis, to actually look what is the value of grandma's biometrics. And I, I say that not to break away from the national security aspect of it, but I say that to identify the 99%. So we can't forget the 99% as well. So I will, we will be commissioning a study uh, independent. I'm still working the details on that, but we'll actually determine value, and it will be a cost-benefit analysis. Thank you for that, and thank you for your partnership as well. You guys have been great. Thank you.
Elaine, thanks so much. Um, I, I'm interested in, in uh, your, your discussion of the Mexican data sharing and you know the infrastructure that Mexico has along their northern border, our southern border, is not nearly, for example, what the Canadians have at their border. Um, how do you look at what kinds of information Mexico is already collecting that they could share and do you, how do you see sort of the trajectory on that? Yeah, no, I, I just think that that relationship in, <clears throat> in terms of the biographic side, I think it's important to note that Mexico is deploying, in fact, uh, license plate readers to all of their uh, lanes going into, into Mexico. Um, they hope to be finished by the summer, so certainly it, it doesn't take someone to take it to the next step, which could be if that infrastructure is already in place with the license plate reader, very similar to our land border, what would it take if maybe an RFID reader was there? What if they're building any type of new facility in pedestrian that I start to look at some of this capability on the RF, RFID reader side? And also it's important to note that in Mexico, which I didn't know, they have checkpoints when you go into the interior. And for those of you that are American and Canadian in the room, you're supposed to pull over and fill out your arrival before you go into the interior. Now, uh, Mexico sees that as an invitation. Uh, on the U.S. side, we sort of see it as a, not an invitation, but <laughs> they see it as an invitation. But what are they collecting there? And in Mexico's southern border, they are actually collect collecting biographic data from the foreign nationals, especially fr from Guatemala and a few of the others. So I think that's sort of like a new frontier for us and we just really need to exploit that. And I don't know yet what I don't know, but uh, if, my, if you invite me back, maybe you invite me back in a year, um, I hope to scratch away at that unknown environment and give you some actions. But certainly that's where my first is to leverage the technology initiatives. Uh, and they're using a lot of our solution. And, and that's a home run. Thank you all very much. Is Martine here? Oh, come on up, please. Thanks. Um, sure, wherever you'd like. Ready to go? Okay. Oh. All right, we're going to start the next panel here. So, first of all, I'd like to thank David and the Canada Institute for inviting uh, the Mexico Institute to participate in this event. And uh, it's been a really interesting comparison. I think a lot more has happened so far along the, the US-Canada border, as we've heard. Uh, but there's obviously lots of thought going into what can be done at the US-Mexico border as well. And, and we're really happy to be part of this conversation. Uh, thank you all for joining us this morning on a rainy, cold morning. Uh, I'm going to jump right in and introduce our panelists. Uh, we're very lucky to have uh, the, the two speakers that we have today for this panel. Uh, we're going to take a little bit more of an approach from this is uh, the business community, uh, the private sector, uh, taking a look and responding to some of these initiatives and proposals, uh, and also thinking a little bit more about the implementation side. How feasible are some of these things? What would implementation actually look like? And what are some of the concerns on the implementation side, uh, moving from policy to implementation in a certain respect? So. I'm going to start off by introducing Martin Rojas, uh, who's joining us today. He's the, he serves as Vice President for Security and Operations at the American Trucking Associations. Uh, it's ATA. He joined ATA in 1996 as Director for International Affairs. Uh, and ATA is the, the national trade organization representing the interests of the U.S. trucking industry. 
His primary duties are to coordinate ATA's security-related policies and activities impacting the trucking industry, focusing on making the movement of trucks throughout North America as safe, efficient, effective, and secure as possible. Uh, he works closely with ATA's counterparts in Canada and Mexico to improve cross-border operations and to finalize implementation of NAFTA. Prior to joining ATA, Rojas worked for the U.S.-Mexico Chamber of Commerce. Uh, he has a Master's in Public Administration from George Washington University. Thanks a lot for joining us today. My pleasure. Thank you. Uh, I'm also going to just go ahead and introduce Tova. Right off the bat, we're going to start the presentations with Martine and then move on to Tova Ladir. Did I pronounce your last name correctly? Close. I'm sorry. Okay, Very close good. enough. Very good. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> um, she is the Managing Director of International Biometrics and of the International Biometrics and Identification Association, it's IBIA. On behalf of IBIA, Ladir develops policy and public education strategies, working closely with Congress, the administration on all issues relating to the deployment of biometrics in homeland security operations, as well as commercial and consumer uses and consumer uses of biometrics. <laughs> She's a member of the District of Columbia Bar and received her JD from the University of Washington School of Law. Thank you so much for joining us today as well. Um, you know, I, I think from, from the policy side as sort of the lead into this conversation, I think what we've, what we've heard is that if, there, if immigration reform does pass, uh, there's very likely to be some sort of a mandate for ed entry exit systems around the air, land, sea borders of the United States. Um, have actually here the just to, to read it very it's a uh, two sentences the GOP uh, principles on immigration reform that were just released their statement about the entry exit tracking system I think that uh, just drives home the point of, of what a likely reality something in this direction will be if we do have immigration reform passed this year uh, it says a fully functioning entry exit system has been mandated by eight separate statutes over the last 17 years at least three of these laws call for the system to be biometric, using technology to verify identity and prevent fraud. We must implement the system so we can identify and track down visitors who abuse our laws. It's just a very clear statement of, of the importance that is placed on this by the, the Republicans in the House of Representatives as they think about immigration reform this year. Uh, but I think there, there are lots of questions. Uh, you know, is this realistic? Uh, how, what is realistic? Uh, is, is, re is biometrics realistic? Is just biographic realistic? What's the time frame that we're talking about for implementation? Uh, what will some of the challenges that, that we face along the way be? And I think one of them specifically looking at the land borders is simply volume. Uh, I mean, we're talking about around 100 million vehicle exits and around 10 million truck exits at our land borders each year. Actually, I don't know how many exits happen. I just know how many entries happen, and I'm assuming that those numbers are, are the same because that's the data that we currently collect. Uh, but it gives us a snapshot uh, of what the size uh, of the challenge is in a certain respect. I think there, there are lots of other things in terms of infrastructure uh, and some questions in terms of the technology as well, and I think that our panelists can help us break these down and analyze them a bit further, and then we'll have a chance for some questions to finish things up. Uh, Martine? Take it away. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much, Chris, and uh, and thanks to the Wilson Center for the invitation, and uh, and thank you very much, Chris, for reminding me of the path that got us all the way up to here in so many years. And some people believe that you know when I joined ATA, I basically joined to work on the NAFTA trucking issue. Uh, it's been 20 years in the making. They think I've got great job security, <laughs> and uh, and we're still working on that specific issue. But clearly, uh, from our specific viewpoint in the trucking industry, it is a uh, uh, the borders are sort of our lifeline and our lifeblood for North American trade. Um, as Chris mentioned, uh, I would say, and, and, and you're right in extrapolating a little bit, because we only capture the entries of the trucks, uh, as CBP does, we don't capture the exit. So roughly we have about 6 million truck crossings ca coming in from Canada and about 4.5 million coming in from Mexico. So you double that, you know, 12 million, 9 million, we crossings going both ways. Uh, moving about 70% of the value of the trade between our three countries. Uh, so a very important industry and, of course, the border uh, efficiency issue and effectiveness uh, is a critical component for us being able to move the cargo uh, in, a, in an appropriate manner. And not just for the trucking industry per se, but for all those customers who depend on the deliveries to arrive on time. As you know, uh, there's a just-in-time uh, delivery industry, the automotive industry, for example, which is uh, well ensconced throughout North America. And some people, uh, there's some studies say that, for example, components in an automobile might cross the border seven times between the U.S. and Canada. 
as it moves back and forth. So many of our customers are very dependent on an efficient border to be able to get the parts in on time. And today, believe me, we already face delays coming in. So you have to take those delays into consideration when you're operating in an adjusted time environment. So we already are facing entry delays. Our concern in the, uh, in the viewpoint of the biometric entry exit requirement would be the potential for an additional process upon exit now resulting in the delays that Colleen talked about uh, on the exit side. And, you know, we're not against security. Uh, we're not against biometrics. Biometrics is now becoming a very common operation within the trucking industry. Uh, most of you might have heard of the Transportation Worker Identification cre Credential created by the Maritime Transportation Security Act, which requires truck drivers entering port facilities to have a, a TWIC card. And a TWIC card is it's supposed to work. It's a $129 smart card that is supposed to work with biometrics and a biometric reader. Of course, we sort of put the cart before the horse and we've got the, the cart, but we don't have the full readers yet uh, in place at the ports, uh, which is a challenge. Um, but uh, the biometrics are, are expanding. We're not against them, we're, and, and we're not against the whole process. Our view is, is basically that we need to make the borders more efficient. Uh, if biometrics can help us get there, great. Uh, if, if uh, you know, we obviously are impacted by WITI, uh, Western Hemisphere Travel Initiative, uh, and some of the cards that we get in addition to the TWIC, many truck drivers also have fast cards, which are part of the Free and Secure Trade Program, which is basically a, a North American security supply chain program, which includes the Customs Trade Partnership Against Terrorism uh, within the U.S. It includes a partner, the uh, Partners in Protection in Canada, and now in Mexico they're developing a similar system called uh, Nuevo, uh, Nuevo Esquema de Empresas Certificadas, the NEC. And so we have all these supply chain programs in place within North America, which include a credential which is uh, RFID capable. And, and as we're continuing to look at what, what are the impacts, what are the technologies that are coming on board, well, today we have, from the trucking industry perspective, we have automated commercial environment in the U.S., we have ACI in Canada, and, and something's going to be developing in Mexico. In Mexico, there's some very interesting changes taking place right now within the customs environment. But, so we have customs automation systems, which are receiving all the information by law at least one hour prior to entry into the United States, on the, on the land border, half an hour if you're a CTPAT certified. You're receiving the cargo information, you're receiving the driver information, and you're receiving the vehicle information prior to the truck actually arriving at the border. So you're getting all this information that you know what's already, what's coming at you. And you've already done background checks, you've done assessments of the, v, of the, of the carrier, if it's capable, if it's meeting, or if it's compliant, if it's validated, all these sort of things. And, and, um, and as we look at that, we're trying to say, well, what is the border of the future that we, knew, that we need to look at? It's going to be clearly an automated border, and it has to be a much more automated border. We actually have told Mr. Winkowski uh, at CBP that, you know, the borders of the future should be almost like the Walmart or the Home Depot, where you, where you go to Home Depot now, you have all your stuff in the cart, you get to a cashier, and you can either go to a cash register with a person or just an automated cash register and just wind your stuff through. If you have all the information about the vehicle, cargo, and driver prior to arrival, we should be able to do that at the port of entry also, an unmanned entry gate, for example, for CTPAT carriers. The, the issue with the uh, exit biometric, um, the way I look at it is, um, well, first of all, I have a bit of a problem trying to understand how it's going to stop the visa overstayer issue and, and what the actual actual practical implementation is what the, what the impact is going to be on the visa overstayers. And, and just from my perspective, I mean, you know, a lot, of the, a lot of the illegal entries that happen on the border today obviously happen between the ports of entry, not at the gates. Um, and, and so trying to capture somebody who might be here illegally, then all of a sudden leaving the U.S. and trying to capture biometric and, you know, he's He's here illegally. Obviously, if he's here illegally, he's probably not going to get the three-year denial. He's going to get the 10-year, don't come back. But who cares? He's going to come back through the port of, between the port of entry anyway. So what I'm trying to look at is how do, do we not throw out the baby with the bathwater? You know, how do we not shoot ourselves in the foot, from our perspective, in establishing this entry exit control system uh, that has a negative impact on trade, which is so important for job creation and all the other issues that we're trying to develop in the U.S.? 
Uh, last, I would mention that you know, there are potential solutions. One of them is going to have to be, and, and I think part of the legislation deals with it, who actually has to provide a fingerprint upon exit. Well, it's basically going to be whoever needs to provide a fingerprint upon entry. So I could see an explosion of the increase in the program, such as Nexus, Century, Fast, uh, Global Entry. I love Global Entry, by the way. I mean, I just think it's the best thing. I mean, it's just coming in from anywhere, especially through Miami, and just getting that separate lane, which is something we really need at the ports of entry, by the way. We don't truly have fast lanes. We have fast gates. So I think there needs to be an expansion greatly of the trusted traveler programs in order to real, tr really be able to try to meet this mandate. It, I know they, they've asked eight times to try to implement it through legislation, but they're not going to it's t really tough to implement something that is not a good idea. And that's part of the challenge. Um, the, uh, the other thing I would say in, in addition to that is we really need better infrastructure. And, and people, I think in the earlier panel, and Colleen mentioned it too, the infrastructure component is critical. Uh, and, uh, and recognizing that we don't have the necessary manpower to man all the gates, I think this automation process that I sort of presented before is very important to do and it's something that we need to do. Pre-clearance is another issue that we're also working on quite clear. There are pre-clearance pilots going on on the Canadian border, uh, and uh, uh, both in Buffalo, I think, now, and uh, in Blaine. There's something similar going on on the Mexican border. So there's a lot of interaction, as Colleen mentioned, related to the interaction between Mexican Customs, U.S. Customs, Canada Customs, and, uh, and U.S. Customs, and I think that's very important, and that's very helpful for us. The single entry process in which their entry becomes our exit, not just for immigration purposes, but for cargo purposes. And so we need to really arrive at a, at a North American single entry process, uh, a true fast process, per se, for, for, the, uh, for the trade environment. Um, I mean, there's a number of other issues I would, I would raise, but I think I'll leave it at that if that's appropriate, if that's enough time or, you know. Don't want to steal too much of Toba's uh, thunder anyway. But. <laughs> I can't believe I'm not down on the floor after listening to all the previous. And, and we're very positive. I mean, we're, we're, we're supportive. We just are concerned, when, and we've told this to, uh, uh, to uh, staff up on the Hill, um, that one of the issues, if you're going to be really wanting to implement this system, you're going to have to throw a lot of money at infrastructure on the border. And we're talking a lot of a lot of money. Because if you go to San Isidro today and you just look at the entry side, <laughs> I mean, there's people coming in through bicycles. There are guys who rent bicycles to other people so they can come in through the bicycle lane. I mean, it's just, it's, it's, it's a carnival, but um, it, it's, it's incredible the mass of people coming through that. Now having to check those going out through that same port of entry, I don't wish that on anybody. So that's it. Thank, Thank you. Thanks, Thanks for your attention. attention. Uh, so we'll take it away. I think you'll be able to help us uh, understand a little bit more where the technolo technological challenges are versus some of the infrastructure challenges and the, you know, it's, it's taking technology and, and finding a way to put it in place also where, where some of these challenges really lie. Thank you, Chris, and thanks to the Wilson Center and to my co-panels, and I have to talk to you about TWIC <laughs> before you depart today. Uh, IBIA is a trade group and uh, it promotes and advances the responsible use of identification technologies to manage human identity. And the starting point for IBIA in this whole discussion of entry exit is that it is a crucial and effective program that enables the government to know who enters the United States and who leaves. It is much like, in a sense, the, uh, the responsibility to know who lives in the United States. I mean, we do, we do, we do um, you know, regular census throughout the country to find out who is there. And what we learn it has an impact on how certain, on voting, on apportionment, on receiving benefits, et cetera. And exit is really important to fully implement the system, the integrated system that Congress initially uh, uh, envision and it would account to and to solve its visa overstays and security problems. What what biometrics brings to the table compared to the other technologies that we have discussed today, all of which are relevant and I see that um, that whatever solution is is going to use kind of a bunch of these technologies. There's just not one simple solution. But what biometrics brings is it focuses on human identity. It determines who. Who is here? Who is leaving? Who is coming in and why? And that identity is important because it is always the evildoer. It's not the technology 
that creates the problems. It is the person and what they bring to it. And it is very important to know who, in fact, we are dealing with, who lives in the United States, who comes to visit the United States, and who exits the, the United States. And for example, on visa overstays that we have talked about, you can't get a handle on visa overstays without knowing the number of entries and the number of exits. It's simply not possible. If you don't check who is leaving, how do you know how many people are really left in the U.S.? And is it the person, and is the person who is left in the United States the original person that came in with the visa? Unless you have a mechanism for actually determining that identity, you don't know that particular answer. Um, from, from IBIA's perspective, we really want to see the program succeed. And that's, that's what it's all about. We want it to roll it out without serious hitches. We want it on schedule. We want it on budget. We want all of those things. And we see, ultimately, that the use of biometrics will help to achieve that. And it will give you that assurance of identity of who somebody is. The, um, there are two parts to this. One is, bio, is the technology that you use to determine the um, the person that you're dealing with, the most effective means of identification to ensure that the person exiting is the same person who entered. That's what the biometric system does. And it is, in fact, the most effective means of identification that is available today. Uh, NIST, in its recent report on FIPS 201-2, uh, makes that very clear. It says that photos, visual inspection of, of people, uh, have very little confidence of providing the assurance of identity that you need. The same thing with certain kinds of biographic data. It is just too subject to, to error. Pins, passwords, a bit better, but still subject to, to hacking, to stealing, and even to sharing. And they ultimately, they con NIST concludes after much study and much research, because at the beginning they also had their doubts about the reliability and accuracy of biometrics in different contexts is that biometrics is the most effective means available for determining identity. And identity is key in, in this biometric entry exit program. And uh, one of the new uh, concepts that has been pushed is that you can use big data or, or enhanced biographic data and that that will provide almost the same assurance of identity that would be available with, with a biometric and less expensive and uh, less intrusive and probably quicker as well. And, uh, and I, I, we're not sure that that is in fact the case. The, um, what is, first of all, what do we mean by this? First, you know, it means that the theory of this is that you have enough data about somebody then uh, that then that person essentially self-authenticates. If you ask questions, detailed questions, either secret questions or things that are automatically generated by a computer, that if you do this, that this amount of data will make it clear who the individual is. The the theory and the practice really diverge a bit on uh, in the on big data. The um, First of all, where does the information come from? It comes from the internet, okay? So what that means is that the, the data has to be mined, and if um, any, you know, identity thieves do the same thing. They go out on the internet and they collect all this personal data and they sell it, they, they, uh, they use it, they share it, they, they find people. And for, um, you know, if you're, you're depending upon data alone again, you know, without, actually forming identity, you know, people share that. It's very easy to, uh, to do. There are errors in the accumulated data. There are people who are, in a sense, you know, off the net in any significant, uh, significant way to do that. And is it really practical on, ent on exit or in immigration in general where you want to have um, 
you don't want to have a discussion with a CBP agent on, you know, on biographic data. There is no way that that is going to be as fast as an automated as an automated system for, you know, for making those comparisons to see if the person who is leaving is the person who came in, and vice versa, and to know with a high level of confidence that this is in fact the person, and. Um, it takes time. It takes a human to make all those kinds of determinations to do that if the goal is to really know who. And I think that is fundamentally the basic issue in a lot of these security programs or, in fact, with, you know, a visa overstay. You want to know that the person who is leaving is the person who came in. And it comes down to that kind of identity. So it's also, you know, exposes new data to the public. It's just not going to be as fast as, fast as an automated uh, system at, um, at this point. Um, the, the, the other thing where, where we, the second issue that is important, having settled that biometrics is the most effective means of identification available today. The second issue really relates to the logistics and infrastructure, and that is different from, from the whole question of, um, of, uh, of the technology. There's little doubt that you could really put together the, the, the technology, the biometric technology system, the back end, et cetera, in about a year. Though that can be done quickly. The issue is really the logistics for the deployment. They, have, they are very complex, and they do vary by, every, by whatever la land, sea, or airports that you're talking about. There are numerous stakeholders who have legitimate concerns, as, as Martine does, about maintaining and facilitating trade and commerce. And, and this is, we don't have a direct responsibility as IBIA in actually implementing any of the logistics and infrastructures, but as we have participated in a huge number of projects over the years, we have some guidelines that we have kind of developed that we think could help facilitate the infrastructure and the logistic uh, issues. Um, first, we believe strongly that you need a staged rollout. It can't be. Uh, any other way. The idea that you could do something in two years is, you know, is, is fantasy at this point. And that's why the House C Homeland Security Committee, which talks about a, a stage rollout, is going to be the way that you're going to have to go. And not only that, the, the, the bill also can, and it involved the stakeholders. It represents, you know, the way that I think that we have to work on this, that all the stakeholders get involved. And more importantly, they realize that you know you, you have a time frame in the bill, but that may not work. You may have to in the future delay it even further. And so you're prepared for the fact that there will, you know, that things may change, that there's going to be some degree of flexibility that's required. And the stage rollout, however, you know, length of time it ultimately it takes, especially on the land borders, we all acknowledge that that is the real problem, that the stage rollout can mitigate risks, inform subsequent stages, accommodate unique requirements of different transportation modes and port configurations. So you have to, you know, do that kind of thing. We're basically, IBIA basically lives by and supports a crawl, walk, run strategy. And that's how we feel about the, uh, about the exit program, that this is going to be the only way to do it. But you want to do it correctly, and you want to be able to make that determination about who. And um, we also believe that good DHS requirements, <laughs> definition and in, uh, initially including industry input, staging, uh, you know, providing for mathematical modeling as we go forward with trying different solutions, as well as the, um, as, 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 as the way that you're talking about doing, that you really have pilots along the way at all the time so that you can do one thing, learn from that, then go forward with something else. There really is, this is, a, this is big, there's no other way. I mean, you'd look, you think you'd like to be able to swallow it in one big bite, but it does not, you know, really work out that way. And um, we want to bring all stakeholders into the process. And um, 
also want to point out that the use of biometrics for actually determining who, for actually making a, a, a knowing who, what is, the, what is the identity of the person in front of you, the best way to do that is with biometrics. That's the only way for now that you have that degree of certainty. And there have been numerous projects worldwide that use this. Now granted, they have different infrastructures, they have different cultures, but they are there and shows that with some thinking and discipline, they can be done and can be done successfully and effectively. And one example to look at that I always admire is the land border between Hong Kong and China. It's huge. They have pedestrians. It's obviously not multi-ports and everything like we have in the U.S. On the other hand, I don't think that we have any one port in the U.S. that really has more traffic than the, that border. They have, uh, they have uh, pedestrians, they have trucks, and they have vehicular traffic. And they have a biometric system that they have used for years, and that's been very effective. And they, the, and they try all different kinds of logistics and infrastructure solutions. Um, for one, for the trucks, they have some big thing that goes up so the driver doesn't have to stretch or anything. I mean, it's just made convenient rather than, uh, and it's mobile. And that, that's another good way that they do it. They have automated gates at the airports that are amazing. People can walk in, give their passports, do their biometric. They get through in no time. It is unbelievable how fast it is. Uh, uh, Amsterdam Schiphol Airport. But Australia, New Zealand, a lot of these countries have, in fact, entry exit systems that implement, that use, incorporate biometrics because they know that this is the most effective way of knowing who you're really uh, dealing with. And in conclusion, I will say that not taking into the car land border, that's, that's something we'll, we'll accept from what I'm going to say. But we believe that the automation technology exists, including biometrics, that will equal or exceed the speed of manual exit processing. Thank you, Chris. Thank, thank you. Thanks very much. Uh, thank you both for very excellent presentations. <laughs> we still have a few minutes for some Q&A. Uh, I'll maybe start by throwing a couple questions on the table while you all collect your thoughts. But we can collect a couple questions at a time also uh, and then get to our, our panelists to let them respond. Uh, one for you, Tova, that I just have to throw out there, and you said it at the very end, is <laughs> what do you do about vehicle exits? I mean, what, what does that look like? What is a biometric solution for vehicle exits um, in the context of the speeds at which traffic is currently leaving? May maybe we can say there will have to be some sort of a, a stop or slowdown, but what is that? What could that even look like? And if you can just hold for one well, sec, I'm going to collect yeah, a couple okay. questions here. Um, and for Martine, I, I was wondering if you can just talk to us a little bit about how data sharing can be part of the solution, you know, both at the Canadian border, uh, we've had experience uh, looking at the, the current projects that are underway, the pilot project, um, and possibly at the Mexican border. You were talking about some of the changes in, in Mexican customs that are underway. Uh, what, what might things look like in the future in, in that respect? Do you have any sort of a vision for us uh, along that, those lines? If there's a question from the audience, we can throw another one on the table, and then we'll go to our, our panelists. Hi, Laura Reese with CSC. I was wondering if you could talk about uh, mobile phones and how those will play into this uh, using global entry and what Martine talked about of uh, traveler doing it on their own um, with biometric applications on mobile phones now. Can't this take the global entry idea and run with it uh, to become a big part of the exit solution for air, sea, and even land, um, and even trains. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, let's grab one more in, in the back, if we don't mind, and then we'll, we'll go to our panelists to respond. Hello, good morning. My name is Eric Nichols. I'm actually with the Department of Agriculture. But I had a question for uh, Martine. Um, I happen to read that uh, Mexico is going to overtake Japan as the number two automobile exporter to the United States uh, this year. Uh, and so I guess my question is sort of, you know, in spite of all the, um, um, you know, friction, if you will, at the border, uh, how is it that, um, um, you know, the trucking industry, uh, the movement of cargo is actually able to, to, to you know, continue and even accelerate, uh, especially, I mean, 
if you consider things like the, the Trans-Pacific Partnership that's coming online, uh, how that will stimulate even further, um, you know, trade and flows across the border. Uh, it just seems like um, we're really kind of reaching a tipping point, and I'd be interested in, in sort of knowing, um, you know, how your, the trucking industry in particular is going to respond to those, uh, those, those emerging pressures. Thanks. Uh, who would like to start? Ladies first? Or okay, I like that. <laughs> All right. The, I don't, uh, on the question about mobile uh, devices, um, I'm not sure that we're at mobile phones yet, but I think one of the near-term solutions uh, for an exit could be the use of mobile devices, particularly at airports and seaports. You, know, you have lines, you, it requires personnel, obviously, who, who would then run your documents through a mobile device, and if you're a U.S. citizen, you know, you, you get to go free. If you're a foreigner, then, you know, and you are within the scope of exit, because people are not always within the scope of, of, uh, of exit, then um, you would have to give your fingerprints, and they can do a check in about eight or ten, eight seconds, I think, that it is, to see that you are the person that you came in, and there are no special alerts about you, then you can go through it. And so it is possible that you could really see if you wanted to get started early, and it is a good way to see how it works with, the, with various technologies that using a mobile device at, at, at exit certainly could you work at a pedestrian exit even at the border. There's no reason why you couldn't use, try to use a mobile, uh, uh, a mobile device, a mobile biometric device to, uh, to handle it. So we see that there is a potentially a great use for the use of mobile devices for a variety of reasons. I mean, there's no reason to necessarily say, okay, we're not going to do anything until we have everything determined you can, in the meantime, use a variety of solutions that at least help and give you some information about what's going on. So mobile devices in, uh, can be extremely, uh, extremely helpful. Thanks. And cars, do you have any thoughts on how that look would look? <laughs> well, on cars, oh my goodness. So that, that, is a, that, it, that is obviously the, you know, the, the big gorilla. And even the Hong Kong people whom we have talked to about their systems will tell you that although they have the car system in effect, that it's still not as good as some of the other parts of it. I mean, one thing is, <clears throat> you know, you can do fingerprints on the fly where there's technology to do that. It's not been fully tested yet, but is a, a possibility. And you can even, you know, because there, Assuming that there is, I mean, you can have somebody to gate, and if there's a backup, you can use mobile devices there too. But that's going to, but these are just interim. You know, at some point, you're going to have to have some kind of automated system that works. And that's why we think it's good to, to have pilots to, uh, to stage it out and figure out what's going to work. But there's also some benefit to starting out with using some mobile devices to see how things work and people's reactions and stuff like that. Thank you. Martin? Um, well, thanks. On the, on the data sharing issue, um, obviously I mentioned a, a little bit of the single entry processes that are being developed uh, between uh, the U.S. and Mexico and the U.S. and Canada. I think those are very important. I think it's the way forward uh, because you're, you're not just capturing, uh, on the commercial side, you're capturing data entry, uh, which is basically your, your information on the, uh, on the cargo. You're doing an automated manifest, which is cargo plus driver plus vehicle. Um, so all this information uh, can be used to sort of do risk-based assessment. And again, I think we always have to continue to really follow sort of the, the risk-based assessment approach and whatever policies we'll develop from a security standpoint, uh, especially uh, what is the uh, sort of cost-benefit, what are the impacts of these, of these programs, and what really makes sense. Um, so that is, that is a very important point. Um, you know, I, I, I should mention that on the southern border, from the trucking perspective, I think we're a little bit better off for the uh, potential implementation of a, of a system that we're talking about because for us, we do have commercial only bridges on the southern border, which is, which is a, a very different operation than on the northern border where you have regular traffic mixed in with trucks too uh, on the bridges. So it, it, is a, uh, it is a bit of a, a, bit of a change. So infrastructure wise, from a trucking perspective, I think we're a little better on the southern border than we are on the northern border. And hopefully if we ever get a new bridge between Detroit and Windsor, uh, all politics aside, um, you know, but all politics are local, as they say. So, um, but, you know, 
um, you know, hopefully we can we can improve that. But data sharing is very important that we move forward on that. And you know, to go into the the changes in Mexican customs, just so you know, uh, and and from our perspective. Um, there's really been a, a very tight control on the Mexican border uh, as to how commercial operations take place, which are basically primarily handled by the Mexican customs broker. So basically, the Mexican customs broker handles all data entry in every single way. I mean, we just we don't do any entry for Mexican customs. So we provide everything to the to the broker. Um, on December 16th, the uh, President Peña Nieto signed a, a, actually promulgated a, a law uh, that now eliminates the requirement of having to go through the Mexican customs broker. Uh, for providing data information to Mexican customs. It's a watershed from our perspective because it allows us now to have more control over how we operate at the border, including the drayage operations than we can now control rather than being dependent on a drayage operation just to cross the border, mind you, a couple of kilometers or miles um, by the Mexican customs broker. So it's a very important thing. There's still some issues that we need to work out in the sense of penalties and, and some of the draconian measures that Mexican customs still has in there operating environment, but, you know, it's, it is a very positive step forward, and I think it's something that's really going to help improve the, uh, the operations at the border. Um, Laura, I think your, the smartphone idea is, is great, um, to be honest with you. Uh, you know, one of the things that we, um, we've always been discussing with uh, CBP are border wait times, and we've been going back and forth as to what border wait times are. I mean, sometimes you go on the CBP website to check out border wait times, and it says 20 minutes. Hard to swallow. <laughs> Because you know you're getting a call from the carrier saying, "What the heck's going on? We got an hour and a half wait at uh, Laredo, or two hours, or something." You know, at the World Trade Bridge. Uh, a lot of the studies that are being done on border wait times are being used are, are using cell technology to figure out, okay, where where is it located? Where's it going? So, uh, it's part of the technology that needs to be looked at. Uh, obviously, we all have our you know boarding passes now on a smartphone. Um, you know, there's going to be readers on a fingerprint. I mean, you can log onto your computer now with a fingerprint, and you can do that on a smartphone. I mean, I think biometric is expanding. The other issue I would raise is that biometrics is not just fingerprints. Right. It includes iris scans, stuff like that. I mean, perhaps scary, but at one point in the future, maybe at the border, there'll be like all these red lines that you just basically drive through, you know, and, <laughs> and it reads your, your, your iris. And, <laughs> and, you know, if it's not you, boom, boom, but, you know. <laughs> If you're good to go, you can go, right? So, I mean, but the, the reader, I think, is, is going to be a, an, an interesting issue. But I think the smartphone technology is definitely there, and it's something that we need to look at uh, as to how we capture that data, in addition to all the RFID and all the other stuff that we're doing. I mean, it's, there's so much data being provided today that is crazy. And the, the good thing that I view is there are the, the, the customs agencies in all three countries are really working together. I mean, there's people here from Mexico at the Nor National Targeting Center, and they're doing outbound, you know, intel. And they're trying to figure out, you know, a lot of the cash that is leaving, there's a lot of issues related to some of the things that are leaving the country, not just coming into the country. You know, flows of cash going back to the narcos. And so that's something that has, uh, that is being looked at and is being worked on jointly too. So very important. And to uh, Eric's point on the auto industry, um, auto exports. Yes, Mexico is now one of the largest, um, second largest, I think it's now considered the sixth largest automobile manufacturer in the world, period. Uh, which is a very positive thing, not just from a perspective of what it means for the trucking industry, because it means more stuff coming across the border, which means more business for the trucking industry, but also means that the job creation issue in Mexico is really being developed. And that's a very important thing when it comes to migration, as our friends from MPI and other organizations will see. I mean, you, you do job creation in Mexico, a lot of educational issues going on in Mexico, educational reform, a lot of reforms going on in Mexico. Tough to implement all the way forward, but they've got the right mindset. So. If job creation really improves in Mexico, and we've already seen declining levels of illegal immigration coming into the U.S., you know, that is, that is something to look at. So, um, yeah, the automobile industry is very important. As I said, you know, it's, it's a largely harmonized industry. It's, it's almost seamless within North America, to be honest with you, except for some of the ports of entry that you have to come through. But the just-in-time delivery system, uh, all the, uh, the automated commercial environment, all these things that are allowing us to really move forward uh, it's, it's, that's why we need to get to the point where we have truly automated ports of entry that facilitate that movement Definitely. through all the data that we're providing, through all the security that information that we're providing too, so every, CBP can do all the risk analysis prior to the cargo vehicle and driver arriving at the border. So um, I think that's, that, that is really a, it's, it's a unique industry in the sense of how close the harmony is, is within North America, but uh, very important in, that, in, that, in, our, in our operation. Thanks. Thank you. 
And, and if you don't mind, I'm actually going to add just one thing about that, that last question on, on the, the sort of the projections for trade and border traffic along the U.S.-Mexico border. I think there's an interesting thing. I mean, the amount of trade between the United States and Mexico is, in terms of merchandise, is like six times what it was before NAFTA. So enormous increase, right? You can scale a little bit of that down if you take away inflation, uh, but you can't get rid of this enormous increase in value uh, that's going back and forth between the two countries. The number of trucks crossing the the border is a little bit of a different story, and, and on both borders, actually. So entries to it, North American entries to the United States, trucks at both borders, went from around 8 million in 1995 up to a total of a, a top, a peak, of around 12 million in 2000, almost 12 million. Now it, there's been a little bit of ups and downs with the recession and, and stuff, but we're, we're right around 11 million right now, or in the last, in 2012. Uh, so we're actually not, the number of trucks crossing the border right now is actually less than it was in 2000, even though the value of trade continues to climb. And part of that speaks to what Martin was saying with the change of the dynamics of the Mexican economy, the change of the dynamics really of the North American economy. We've been forced through global competition, sort of the rise of China, et cetera, to be, we've been pushed up the value chain. So now, what is it? It's tons and tons of cars, you know, oh. for example, coming across, those are high value goods. These aren't t-shirts, these aren't shoes. Uh, the nature of the economy has actually been transformed. Okay, so that's, that's been happening, but is that sustainable? Is that the trend into the future? I don't think so. I think we've made that transition largely away from the goods that China beats us at, that, that low labor countries beat us at. So in the future, as trade continues to climb, I think we're back to a position in which the number of trucks crossing the border has to increase. Probably also things like trains, short, uh, short ter um, distance shipping between Mexico and the United States, things like that, it will be alternative solutions. But I think we're, we're heading back to a scenario where you can't increase trade much more without the number of trucks it, crossing the border increasing. If I could just add to that, I mean, I think in October, it was reported the first year that NAFTA trade actually topped $100 billion in a single month. That's incredible. I mean, that's that's you know that's that's a lot of trade going back and forth. A lot of trucks too. But on, on to your point of of the trucking issue, it's not just it's there's there's a lot of issues related to um, uh, to how supply chains are being handled now in the mix between you know in the intermodal systems that are going between trucks and and trains and and what makes sense, what's more efficient, all these things. You know, we're we're one of the largest customers now of of the railroads. Uh, because of the intermodal business. And so there, there's a lot of dynamics taking place within the supply chain operations that have a, a, a very particular impact, um, not just on the supply chain per se, but on cross-border operations, which is kind of interesting to look at too. Thanks very much. I think we've hit the end of the line in terms of our, our time here today. Uh, I'd love to continue the conversation, but we've had an excellent one. Thanks to all the panelists for joining us today. Thanks to all of you for coming out to the Wilson Center. I uh, really enjoyed the discussion. Thanks, Thank uh, thanks again to everyone. Thanks, Chris. Thank you.